Hey there, welcome to Board Game Hot Takes. My name's Tim. And this is Adam. And I'm Connie. And today we're going to be talking about our top five desert island games. And I'll tell you a little bit about what that topic means to me in a minute here. But you heard a new voice on the show today. Connie Vogelman, welcome. Thank you for being our guest host today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited. I uh, really enjoy the podcast and I had a really fun time with this topic, so I'm excited to talk about it. Nice. So listeners, if you don't know who Connie Vogelman is, she's the designer of the recent hits Apiary as well as Wormspan. And if I understand right, I think Wormspan is actually getting its retail release a few days after we're recording this. So right before this episode comes out, should be out in stores. You can pick it up. We'll tell you a little bit more about where you can hear more about those games at the end of this episode. Now, we didn't bring Connie on to interview her. We really just wanted, we just needed a third person. Chris is in Iceland, so she's filling in for Chris this week. So she's our guest host. But I I do have one question for you, Connie. I don't know if you know the answer to this. I'll go for it. I read that Wormspan had a first printing of 100,000 copies. It did. That is correct. (laughs) So, So here's my question for you. Is that the largest first printing of a hobby board game ever. Oh, I, I don't know, but it's certainly large. I mean, you know, anything over about 10,000 is considered very large for hobby, but I will say that, you know, mass market can easily be 10 times that. So I wonder even in mass market, maybe it is, but you know, like a mass market game, because typically your, your mass market stores, they're still, they're reprinting things that have been in the market for, for, you know, for generations, basically most of the games there true first editions are, you know, first printings of a game. I wonder if they're even that big, but the, you're probably right. Maybe that's not that that unusual there. So let's rewind it for the the people that might not understand anything you guys are talking about right now. Mass market, there's a, I'm not saying I don't understand anything you're talking about, but for other people, mass market is like something like Scrabble, for instance, where it's just over and over or Monopoly or your risks, something, the, the things that have been in the lexicon forever. Is that what mass market is? Yeah, absolutely. The games that are on your big box store shelves, like, you know, Walmart and Target. Target is stocking a lot of hobby games now too, but I think, yeah. but I think those hobby games still are just not the same. They're not getting the same amount of sales as like a Monopoly is or something like that. So, okay. right. right. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, I think Target's, Target's great. I mean, I know they commissioned, I believe the Horizons of Spirit Island. And so they're really just kind of jumping head first into the hobby market, which is wonderful. Yeah. I think Jaws of the Lion, uh, Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion was created specifically for, for Target as well initially. So yeah, it's they're very cool. Not only are we getting to see a lot of games there, it makes it fun to go to Target now, but also <laughs> there's some new games being made because of it. Tim, when is the last time you went to Target and didn't go to the board game aisle? I, I don't think it's happened in the last five years, I don't do honestly. Yeah. Like, I have to. I have I, to. Even if I'm not planning to buy anything, <laughs> I have to take a walk down there, see what's on the shelf, to. see if there's something that's a great sale or something like that. Mm-hmm. I don't buy things there too often, but every once in a while, I'll find something I've been thinking about picking up for sure. Well, cool, Connie. Congratulations on on being involved with Wormspan and, and Apiary. Two big hits. Um, but Let's jump into the topic. And as always, we're going to start out with the poll today. And the poll is relevant to this topic of Desert Island board games. So what I asked our listeners on Blue Sky and on our Facebook group was, if you only had five board games of your choice available to you forever, do you think you'd still play board games as frequently as you do? The options I gave, I'd play them more. And that got 10%. Probably about the same got 35%. Less, I'd get bored with just five games, got 54%. And what a stupid question got 1%. So not too bad. I I guess enough people like this question today. How would you guys answer this? So for this poll, I believe I put, I would play them more. So five games that I have totally memorized inside and out. You're going to have the setup memorized. You're just going to be able to, maybe if it's a dead or night, I'm just going to have five different spots where all my board games, all of my board games are all set up and they're ready to go, ready to play at any time. So whether I'm playing against somebody or just doing solo four-handed, which is my usual rigmarole, that is probably what I'd be doing. I do, I think one of the listeners said, you're maybe going to read this, Tim. They said, oh, I'd get sad because there wouldn't be any more new games to explore. And I get that. Like they'd get tired of the, their five games that they had. If I had the brains of like Connie, I would just mix and match components and make my new game. And so I'd have infinite amount of games. But no, I think I'd play the five games I had over and over and over. What about you, Connie? Yeah, I think I would actually be in the less category. I do love becoming an expert at a game and playing it again and again. And I think there's that kind of sort of familiarity and that nostalgia factor once you get to know a game really well. But I think for me, there's a really big part of discovery too. I mean, I love, especially both as a gamer and as a designer, getting to explore new mechanisms, Mm -hmm. see what's out there. And I think the hobby would definitely lose something if that was totally taken off the table. Well, my first thought was exactly that. I, I first thought, of course, I'd play less. A big part of what I do is is I love to learn new games. I, when it's game night, I'm usually picking somebody's new game off their shelf just so I get to try something new. 
But I was thinking back. So I started the hobby in, in Magic the Gathering. And I played Magic the Gathering for 20 years. And I played it as much or more than I play hobby board games now. Like I just, it was in my head. I couldn't wait to get that next game and to get that next tournament. I was playing three or four times a week. And so I did pick one game and played over and over. No, it's a special game. It's a game that has a lot of variability. It has a lot of ways to play it and things like that. But I think even if it had been one box that had enough cards to fit in that box, I think I would have gotten just as hooked into that game at the time. So after I thought about it a little bit and kind of worked through this list, I realized I think I could find a huge amount of fun in just going back to some of my some of these games that I'm going to talk about over and over and over again. And I think I would probably play just as much or would try to anyway. I think there's some nuance with this question. So you take a game that I'm not really interested in, like Go or like Chess, one of these abstracts, and you can start peeling the layers off the onion. What are you going to do with all this time on your hands? You're on a desert island and you have something like Go, you have just black pieces, white pieces and a grid, but you can peel the layers and layers and books have been written about Go strategies and the different patterns that emerge and all these different things. So you take something as simple as Go, three components, basically, and you can go so deep. So I don't know. I do enjoy that discovery of, you know, digging deep into a game, getting to the next level down. Oh, look at this little discovery. Look at this little discovery. So that's something the more I play games, Zool, especially that I absolutely love finding these little nuances in seemingly simple games. Well, I knew that this episode wasn't going to get over without Azul. Oh, it's, it's not we'll done yet. Yeah. Back up like <laughs> <laughs> well, I was also thinking of one other situation. So I, um, a few years back when I got into the hobby, I had started playing some board game apps on my iPad. I was traveling a lot at the time, so I'd, I'd play them on flights. And one of the apps I downloaded was there's a Catan app. I had my iPad in for repair at a local repair shop. And the guy who worked on it, when I brought it in, he's telling me, you know, he fixed the screen. Here's how much it costs. By the way, I saw this app on your on your iPad and I didn't know what he was getting. He was like, do you play Catan? And I was like, yeah, I like Catan. I play a lot of board games. Like, hey, I got a I got a Catan group that meets every Saturday and they've been meeting for like a decade and all they play is Catan. So he invited me to his group and I, I went to one of these game nights and it was a lot of fun, but they are, that's all they want to play. Like we literally played two games of Catan until about midnight when a few more people came and then they busted out Game of Thrones Catan. <laughs> so this is all they'd been playing for like 10 years. And so I asked them throughout the night, I was like, have you guys tried any other new board games? They're like, no, there's nothing as good as this. So I, you know, I think if it's the only thing you got and you love playing, you know, if you're the right, maybe it just depends on the personality, but I think you can find a lot of fun just digging deep. It's just hard for us now knowing that there's so much breadth of different types of games and mechanisms. And we have so much fun exploring it that once, if you take that away, maybe it would feel a little bit more stale. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think one thing too is I do wonder about the hobby a little bit because I think when a lot of us got into it, it was Catan, it was Carcassonne, it was Ticket to Ride. And so I think there was a whole generation of hobby board gamers who basically had this kind of common, you know, shared framework of their entry games. And we played those games again and again and again. Yeah. And I wonder what it's like now for people coming into the hobby. I mean, there's thousands of new games released every year. And I do think you lose something when you don't have that kind of common framework. Yeah, totally. 100% agree on that. Yeah, that's a good point. Like we all probably, I don't know, Scrabble, Monopoly, name any of the Parker Brothers games. We probably played at least four or five that overlap. And we do have, that's a really good point. Kai. Well, cool. Here's what some of our listeners had to say. So Luke Holt said, the reason I don't play games as much is because I have to learn them. Then time goes by and I forget the rules and have to relearn. If I knew five games through and through, I'd play them a ton more. Ryan Winslet kind of agreed. He said, honestly, I might play more. I feel like decision paralysis is a big reason I don't get to the table nearly as much as I'd like. But then on the other hand, Aaron Freya said, I'm part of the cult of the new. I must always be playing new games. If I only had five games, I'd drop out of the hobby completely. So drastic stance there. How much, Aaron, are you really a board gamer? I'm not sure about that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Come on. And then Andy Schwartz, uh, Adam, your, your buddy Andy said, Hey, Andy. No, not even close. A big part of my gaming is exploring new games with other people. The last one I'm going to read here is going to lead us right into our conversation. Christopher Braymeyer said, the real question is, which five do I cut down to? And the answer is, I don't want to, you can't make me. <laughs> but I'm going to make Connie and Adam cut down to five and only five games forever with tonight's conversation. So, Tim, are you ready? You ready to hear this one? You already know what it nope, is. Nope, not yet. Hold on, hold on. So the, obviously the topic tonight is top five desert island games. And I want to, here's what I told Connie and Adam around this topic. I said, 
if you could only play five games for the rest of your life, what would they be? You don't need to focus on the logistics or player count of actually being on a desert island. So Adam, I don't know if you took that to heart or not, because I've heard you make some mentions to desert island already. But the key is that this isn't really just about being on a desert island. You don't need to worry about something that could get sand in it. You don't need to worry about that. It's just you because you, you're Shanghai on an island and can't get off it or something like that. It's really typically difficult for me to dissociate theme with anything going on. So I you know, like, <laughs> it's a <little> <laughs> game. So it's going to be tough for me, but I'll try. Okay. But the point is that this is really just supposed to be a list of our top five games. If we could only play five games ever, what would they, it does not top five games. And I think that's what was really tricky for me here is because it's not just picking your five favorite games. It's like, these are the five games that that's all I'll ever play. Maybe before we get into our list, do you guys want to just give a quick, like, how did you go thinking through this process? Right. So this was a tough one for me to think about because you're right. Like you just said, Tim, it's not like my top five games, although some of these, maybe some of these are my top five games. So I try to go through and think about games that I'll be able to play over and over and over again and not get sick of. So that's what I'm thinking of. If I only have five games left, is there going to be enough to explore to keep me intrigued and occupied and busy and curious forever, for the rest of however long I'm alive. So that's my consideration for making this list. Yeah. And I, I mean, I have a very similar consideration and I'll say too, my list actually really does not overlap with my favorite games very much. Two games on my list I have gotten rid of, like I owned and got rid of. One game I haven't played in at least a decade and one game I will never get rid of, but I will probably never play again. So that's a little bit of a teaser um, because one of the things that I was taking into account with this list was having infinite time, which was maybe an assumption that I shouldn't have built into the scenario, but I did. I figured if we were all stranded on a desert island, we wouldn't have day jobs. <laughs> that was definitely something that I was taking into account when I made this list. I like it. Well, it's perfectly fine because I think the reality is, is that if you have five games, you still have so much more time to explore those five games than you would trying to switch it up between all the other games that you want to play, all the other games your friends want to play. But that's really exciting, Connie. I'm, I can't wait to hear what your list is. I had a little more overlap for sure, but I definitely didn't pick my top five games. And there are a lot of games that I would have loved to put on here that it would or hurt so bad to leave off my island. So it was definitely tricky for me to pick this, but it was a combination of like, what game am I going to want to just continue to deep dive forever with a mix of like, I've only got five games and there are different situations that warrant different types of games. So it can't just be five heavy euros, maybe almost, but not quite five heavy euros. <laughs> definitely a, a, a tricky list, a little bit more challenging than just a top five list. Can I go now, Tim? Can I do my first game? Yeah, okay. <laughs> jump, jump right in. <laughs> All right. You already mentioned this one. I already mentioned this one. This is Azul. What a great, fantastic game that I just fall in love with more and more and more every time I play it. It seems simple, right? There is 20 tiles of each color of, of five different colors. So a hundred tiles in a baggie and you're drawing some of those out. You're putting them on these rows, trying to fill in these rows so they can slide over and make a little mosaic over there on the right. But all of this different strategy emerges. I like the two player game is best. So this desert island is going to have a two player only section and Azul is going to be part of that section. Head to head, you know exactly what's left in the bag. You know exactly what's been played. You know what can still come up. The probabilities are there. The mathematics of this are fun. There's a bunch of different problems you can try to work out in your head. So like I was talking about with Go, all these different strategies that emerge, different little patterns can happen. In Azul, there's the, uh, the juggle of are you going to be the last player in the round? Are you going to have to take these seven red tiles that are going to be left and take a negative 14? Can you figure out with the number of different colors that are remaining and the number of different factories or tiles that are remaining if you're going to be last or if you can avoid it or how you can minimize that? So there's that whole problem. Are you going to go for that second column? Are you going to go for all the colors in one of the rows, try to get that 10 point bonus? So all these different decisions you're trying to make and force your opponent into making these bad decisions, it just goes on and on and on. And every time, every game, there's different opportunities, different ways to go, different ways to get points. How are you going to get those points and force your opponent to get fewer points than you? It's just a great game every time I play. And that's why I could play Azul forever. Any new people that wash ashore on the desert island, they don't have to be gamers. I'm going to teach them Azul and they'll be into it right away. Yeah, I think that's absolutely a great pick. I mean, I think that one just has so much replayability. I could sort of see playing that one until the end of time. By the way, pause this list for a second. I'm assuming Apiary and Wormspan are already on the desert island. I threw, you know, those, those are already going to be in the desert island library. So I don't have to worry about <laughs> bringing those on the island with me. Well, 
first of all, Adam, uh, you don't need to kiss butt right now. Like we're just, you know, it kind of her co-host. She's not a famous board game who's designer. Been, who's <laughs> my kissing exactly? I don't understand what you're talking about. So I think Azul is an interesting pick. And I think it goes right along with that kind of chess and go situation where if you are into it, you could play it forever. And there's an infinite amount of strategy and it's always fun to dig into it. It's just not for me. I don't have like an abstract game, you know, even with that much replayability would never make my desert island and you won't find one of those on my list. Mm. All right. Well, so my first pick is actually a a little bit similar in the sense that it's both my two player pick and my kind of intro gamer pick, but it's it's obviously very different in, in the actual game. And that is Cribbage. And I picked it for two reasons. One is there's a big nostalgia factor for me. Um, I grew up playing it with my family. And so if any of my family are on this desert island with me, it might be the only game that I'm going to get them to play. So that seemed relevant. But also, and this is where I'm maybe cheating a little bit, uh, it also happens to come with a standard deck of playing cards. Smart. Smart. (laughs) Uh, And so it is indeed a board game. Cribbage is sort of like a hand management card game where you're basically just sort of scoring points based on your hand, but you have these little little board with these little pegs because you're scoring a lot of points in sort of ones and twos and threes, and that's kind of how you keep track of your score. But if other people happened to take that that deck of, of cards and play, you know, poker or any of the other million games uh, in the world with the deck of cards, you know, who am I to stop them? So that's that's my <laughs> first pick. That's great. And I, I found a different way to cheat on that deck of cards. But I think it was so hard for me not to just put a, a deck of cards on there because there is like infinite replayability in games like Hearts. You can just go back to yep. it over spades or even, you know, something silly like golf. Like there's so much you can do with a 52 card deck that uh, it's a good, smart move to put cribbage on. That's great. Yeah, it was felt felt impossible to keep it off the list, to be honest with you. All right. Well, my my last one, and I didn't rank these in any particular order, by the way. We do often do a countdown of, of one through five, but it, this wasn't about favorite games. It was just about the games that I had to bring that I have to have with me. And I'm going to be mentioning a couple of games that didn't make the cut in each of these. So it's not cheating. I'm not actually calling out a bunch of games. I'm just, <laughs> well, so I'm just giving you some context. Questionable. <laughs> so uh, my first one had to be something that gave me the feel of a game like Magic the Gathering that I felt like I could go back to over and over again and explore over. And every time I played, it's going to feel a little bit different because you've got different components you're interacting with. And and the, the gameplay has different little combos to put together and each game will play out differently, which is what I think makes Magic the Gathering so replayable. But there's a number of board games that do that really well now as well. And this is probably the closest to what I would say is my these are some of my favorite games of all time, but I'm only picking one of them because I felt like it had to be so good that I only needed one in this category. I left off the list Terraforming Mars, Lost Ruins of Arnak, Tapestry, Dune Imperium, and yes, even Apiary. These are all games with just, to me, infinite replayability. Every time I play it, it's a fun puzzle to put together. But the game that actually made it is Ark Nova. And Ark Nova is a fairly new game, of course, pretty popular. But I just love this game and I've played it like 120 20 times now. I've mentioned it repeatedly. And there's two reasons I picked it. One is that this is a rare game where every time I played it, it feels like I've really got a different strategy to go towards. Like Terraforming Mars, you know, you're going to find a few strategies to kind of go towards or lean into. And I know that's, that exists in Arc Nova, but I just haven't ever found that felt like I was playing the same game on a second time. So it feels like I can keep going back to it. And the second is that this is kind of the heavier, that the heaviest one on this list. And that may seem like a downfall, but I've got some games that'll fit with the people that don't want to play heavier games. The reality is if I'm going to play a game infinitely, I want it to have some weight to it. I want to really have to dig in and learn it and, and have a lot to, to really pick through on there. So for me, Arc Nova felt like a game that I could pretty much go back to repeatedly, almost indefinitely. There's already an expansion for it. So yes, any of these games that I'm bringing on my island are going to have all the expansions that exist for them. But this is one of the few that actually has an expansion. So yeah, Arc Nova, my my number five on the list. Fun pick, Tim. How many players are you going to play that one? Are you going to have four? Because I know we said we had an infinite amount of time, but someone's going to mess up on their thing and they've got to <laughs> rewind it and they have to combo this, combo that, undo this, undo that. It's going to be a mess. Funny enough, one of the one of the key things that I picked here was to make sure that all the games I put on my list could play down to two players because then I can play them with almost everybody. But they have some mix of, and, and all play pretty well. You know, well is relative, Adam. I know you don't think Arc Nova plays well up to four, but I still have a fun time even in a long game of Arc Nova. So yes, I'll play it at four. I'll try that one again. Next up for me, and... Uh, I know we've all not been cheating yet on this uh, this list, but <laughs> my number four game, I guess we'll say, is Dune Imperium with all the expansions, which includes 
Uprising. Uprising. <laughs> That's, <right. laughs> That's the way to go. Maybe some light cheating. <laughs> some, maybe some very questionable cheating here going on. Bending of the rules, we'll say. But yeah, this game, I just got to play it. My dad is still in town. And Sarah, somehow we ended up with no kids in the house for like five hours the other day. So we set up the board games and we got rolling. We rolled through. We finished the first game of Dune Imperium. Rolled right into the second one with the Immortality and Ix expansions. And what a blast. We found all these different new strategies, even with just those two expansions that we hadn't thought about exploring before. You throw an uprising, you have a whole another deck of cards, a whole different play board, all these mix and match expansions, all this deck. Are you going to intermingle? You're going to eventually you're going to have all these wacky ways to play. That's going to be part of the fun is figuring out the different ways to put all these components and all these cards together to get yourself a different feeling board game every time if you want to. So for me, that is my number four, Dune Imperium. That's by Paul Denon, Direwolf Games. Back to Azul real quick. That's by Michael Kiesling and Plan B Games. Anyway, Dune Imperium, that's my number four with all the immense amount of expansions and goodies. Yeah, I definitely consider Dune Imperium. I still haven't played Uprising yet. It's on my short list of games to play, but I really considered both uh, Dune Imperium and Lost Ruins of Arnak. Those were two that really hurt to cut. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice, exactly. And uh, Adam, are you going to buy, have you decided are you going to buy Uprising? Are you going to add it to your collection? Eventually, I'm going to break down and have to go buy it. It just is cool. I really like the design of this one so much that why not go back and get this sort of update more gamey one is what people are saying but the spy mechanism is too cool we're playing it with the mintat here just the fact that the mintat gets or not the mintat your third agent your third worker your sword master your sword master thanks it gets cheaper in uprising which i think is neat so if you're that first person to go there i think it's like seven bucks and then the price goes down for subsequent players to buy it just that alone is like super cool um yeah it's i i want to go and play it again at least and i don't know how i'm going to resist not buying it uh, in the future. Yeah. I don't see a world where I don't end up picking it up. I don't plan to get rid of my current stuff either, but if nothing else, I can play uprising or I can play Dune Imperium and mix in a bunch of different cards to keep it fresh. So right. anyway, Connie, if you like Dune Imperium, I think you're going to love uprising. It's a, it's a really fun revision to it. Yeah, no, that's, that's what I keep hearing. I just, I just have to get it to the table. My next game is actually in the party game slash social deduction slot. I really wanted a game in that kind of broad category. And I went with The Resistance Avalon, which is a game, it's probably the game that I've played the most, a uh, number of hours and number of games. I'm not sick of it yet. I'll probably never get sick of it. Basically, it's a social deduction, deduction game where you have a larger team of kind of good players and then a smaller team of bad players who have more information. And I think there's three reasons that this game has really, really kind of risen to the top for me of these kind of social deduction games. And one is that at its core, Avalon is very much of a, a deduction puzzle. I think anyone who says, oh, it's just people shouting at each other are sort of missing some of the nuances in the game. There's a lot of, of really good information um, and a lot of really good deduction you can do. I think there's no bad characters other than maybe the assassin, but you know, you never really have that experience where you flip over your card and you're like, oh no, I have this awful character. Everything's going to be terrible. And then the third thing is like, because there's this constantly shifting meta, you know, you never really know what the other players at the table are going to do. And so it's just always presents a new puzzle. And I mean, as I said, I've literally played this game thousands of hours and I'm still not sick of it. So it, it had to come to the island with me. That's awesome. Are you a, are you a convention goer, Connie? Do you, have you, do you go to board game conventions? Or are you going to try to? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do to some extent. And I know Blood on the Clock Tower is really the one that has absolutely taken over lately at these conventions. And Man, I don't know. I still just like the resistance better. No shade on Blood on the Clock Tower at all. I know an awful lot of folks would, would choose to bring that one to their island. That's cool. No, and the reason I asked about cons, uh, yes, I've heard a ton about Blood on the Clock Tower. It actually, it sounds like too much for me, but I had a chance to play the resistance years ago, only once though. And I've never played the resistance Avalon. So I was going to say, if we're ever at a convention together, let's see if we can get that played because it'd be really fun to explore with somebody that loves it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think those characters, they have they have a set of the same characters in Resistance as well, sort of with the sci-fi theming. But I think adding those characters makes a huge difference. Um, it really kind of ratchets up, I think, the level of, of kind of depth and complexity and decision making involved. I have never played any kind of Resistance. I would love to. I hear about this one a lot as being interesting. So I, I don't have much experience with social deduction games at all. Shamans is about the only one. So what's the difference between like the Avalon version? Is it just theming or like the Merlin? Is Merlin different or something? Yeah. So the resistance, I think, was was the original, I believe. And that's basically just good guys versus bad guys. The bad guys know who each other are. The good guys don't know anything. 
When the retheme for Avalon came out, they added some characters who have knowledge. So Merlin is a good character who knows two of the three evil characters, three-ish, it depends on player count, evil um, characters. You have one um, evil character who's basically trying to mimic Merlin. You have a Percival character who knows who Merlin is and then who that evil mimic character is. And then you have an evil player that's completely hidden. And so you add these kind of extra layers in of who knows what, and then you sort of have this Percival character who's trying to mimic Merlin, and then Merlin is trying to hide, and then Morgana the sort of evil mimic character is trying to mimic Merlin. And so you just have all of these different dynamics at the table. And then I think, again, that with, um, you know, every round of the game, you basically, somebody nominates a team and then everyone votes, you know, basically up or down on that team. All of a sudden you actually start gathering a lot of information and you can really learn a lot from that if you can keep track of the votes, which is of course, let me, let me put it this way. It gets harder as the night progresses. (laughs) Okay. Gotcha. That's cool. Adam, I think you'd actually like social deduction quite a bit. It seems it's right up your alley. That's why you love Shaman so much. It sounds awesome. The way you're describing Connie, it sounds pretty awesome. It's it's a wonderful game. Our co-host Chris, on the other hand, absolutely hates it. He hates lying to anybody in person. So uh, but let's not include him on that game night. Oh, so that's my follow-up. Do you have to lie in this game? <sighs> Probably. Okay. Um, I think it would be very hard. If, if you were one of the good characters, you basically don't. I think it's pretty hard to get away with it if you're one of the evil characters and not lie a little bit. Okay. But that being said, it's really not a, yo, you're evil. It's a, look how I voted. Look at look at my votes. My votes tell that I'm good. And so it's, for me, like, I would never play yeah. something like Spyfall. Like, I hate something like Spyfall because that's you're basically being asked to lie and just hope for the best. This is has has a lot more sort of concreteness to it. So with nuance, you could probably pull it off without necessarily going full liar. I think so. I, I actually okay. will honestly say that I think you could make it through quite a few games without lying, okay. but you're going to have to be kind of clever to do it. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, that's the hard part, right? It's it's not just about the lying that he doesn't like. It's the fact that like, oh God, I would say, and I'm terrible at these games because I have no poker face at all. Like everybody knows immediately if I'm the traitor or not. It's like, it can be as simple as like, oh, Tim's actually shutting up for once. He's obviously the traitor. He's trying not to give anything away, <laughs> but whatever. I still have fun playing with. All right. Well, my number four here is, so here's the deal. Sometimes you've been away cutting coconuts out of trees all day. You're building your fort. You're you're trying to survive on this desert island and you're just exhausted at the end of the day. And I just don't feel like a heavy game. And this happens to be pretty frequently. And one of my go-tos, and I think a game that I will want to go back to indefinitely is a light card game called Sea Salt and Paper. This is by Bruna Catala and Teo Riviera. And there were a number of games I considered in this category, although this is the one that I consistently go back to. Everybody I introduce it to has fun with it. It's great and kind of different at, at two through four player counts. So it works at all player counts. That was the main reason why I picked those over things like Scout or Teach You or Haggis is just because it is really flexible, at least in that small range of player counts. But I just love going back to that. I probably played this game a hundred times and it's just like the, the after dinner quick game. We got 20 minutes. Well, you know, our daughter's finishing up homework or I've got, you know, a, sitting at a pub with a friend and chatting over it. We can sit there and play it. So I wanted a light card game that you could kind of have a social situation in. It's kind of brainless, doesn't take too long to play and see salt and paper has been a huge hit. I've been playing it a ton for a year. I think it's going to be on the table for years to come. So it's got the sea legs it needs to survive on my desert island. Yeah, you can't argue against just a nice sit down card game, shuffle them up, let's get it going and let's uh, have some coconut juice and lime sounds great tim this is actually a, a deck of 64 cards so i figured if you get desperate you can always write the suits and numbers on all of the you know just like a create a traditional playing deck out of it and then you've got infinite infinite games with this Smart. one and i like that you went back to the theme that you, you are coming out with some themes some desert islands so <laughs> well, you guys are kind of forcing me into it <laughs> <laughs> well i have to say that this this desert island is sounding better and better i mean unlimited time to play games apparently we have drinks you know shelter friends what more could we want right <laughs> what what more what more okay so already during the course of this episode, Connie's inspired me to make some revisions to my list. So moving up from my five spot is Fractal Beyond the Void. This is one I've been talking about a lot. Not that many people have this one or know about it. It's relatively newer designers here. And these are tough to say for me. So I apologize. Jan Hilaire, Romain Lesuc, and Bernardo Rippe, where the publisher is Board Games Studio and Board Game Inc. Anyway, why do I like this game so much? It's out in outer space. I love outer space. You have your toys. You got your little spaceships, your big ones, your small ones. You got some little mech dudes and some little trooper guys flying around. So whatever, you got your toys. You have a variable setup. You have a hexagon grid map. You've got different planets and you've got different modes of play in the back of the book. 
also this game has a campaign mode. So I think it's like 10 or something scenarios that you can work your way through. So I figure once every six months, we'll play a different episode of the campaign, introduce some new components. And then we have six months to play with that new component set or mix and match all the different things with what we've just discovered with the different modes of play. And then six months later, we do the next campaign scenario. So this game is going to drag out for years and years and years with new things to come if we want to do it that way. I'm sure somebody at some point will have too many coconut and limes. Tim is going to go in there and dig around and check out this new faction, Adam. Let's do it. Maybe not. Maybe we can rein him in. But anyway, I see lots of variability, many different plays. I played this game at two players with real people, three players by myself. It's just an exciting game. Yeah. Don't look at me funny, Connie. This is a normal thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just wondering, was it, was it three-handed or was it sort of yeah. against like two? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so three-handed, exactly, yeah. yeah. Different factions just to explore them and, you know, nobody wants to play a giant nerd game with me. The card market is exceptionally cool in this game. That's something you're not going to see every time. But anyway, this game is fantastic. A lot of different ways to play it. A lot of things to discover. A big old box of fun stuff. Fractal will be on the void. Awesome. Well, I'm, look, I'm looking forward to playing it sometime. I have not gotten a chance to play it yet. Have you heard of it, Connie? Yeah, I mean, just from this podcast. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> Adam, we, you did, we did play a three-player on Tabletop Simulator That's back when right. the Kickstarter was first out. Do you feel, can you remember, like, is it, do you feel it's drastically different from what we played or do you think it's pretty similar? It's pretty similar. A little bit of refinement, which made it better or, Mm -hmm. you know, from what I recall, it seemed a little more streamlined from a couple of little glitches and hiccups that we had when playing it online. That seemed to be pretty smoothed out or maybe I just, it just sunk in more and the rules sunk in and it made a lot more sense how to play it. I'm going to be able to teach this thing to you guys quickly and we'll be up and running in no time and you guys will be coming up with a new strategy, kicking my butt very early on in this game. I think, I hope you guys will enjoy it. That's what I like to hear, kicking Adam's butt and getting up to speed quickly. <laughs> yeah, I think there's something to be said about a game that has a lot of like campaign to explore, a lot of content. Like I thought I would put something like Gloomhaven or Frosthaven on the list because it feels like we'd never have enough time to kind of explore those games fully. But there is still, to me, an infinite amount of time. They are grindy in a way where a game that's more like a Euro you know, like Fractal is, I don't know if you'd call it a Euro, but it's kind of like just a standalone game that then has a story to explore, kind of a campaign to explore that you can reset. That seems like a ton of fun to me. And in fact, I'll be talking about one of those pretty soon. So yeah, interesting pick, Adam. Mm-hmm. And I can't wait to to talk about how wrong you are about it once we actually play it together again. <laughs> well, speaking of campaign games and also Gloomhaven and Frosthaven, my next game is actually Gloomhaven. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> nice. So... You Sorry, know, jumped I, ahead of you there. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. So I played a full campaign of Gloomhaven, and I'm about a third to halfway through Frosthaven, and it's become sort of my favorite event of the week. We have a steady group. We get together once a week. We play, and it's just become a wonderful experience. And I wanted one cooperative game on my list, especially because once we get to my number one, there's going to be a lot of hard feelings, perhaps, on our island, and so we need sort of a way to smooth things over a little bit. <laughs> and so I definitely wanted a co-op game. And I, I really thought about Spirit Island as well. I think that's another one that obviously has a lot of depth and a lot of replay value. But this one, to me, there's just so much in the box. And I could just see playing that campaign several different times, you know, all playing different characters and different builds of each character. There's just so much to explore there. Um, And I'll make a slight plug for Gloomhaven over Frosthaven, too. I know, objectively speaking, Frosthaven has more, but it's almost gotten too complicated for me. There's all these big base building steps, and some of the missions would be very good if you had a computer to automate them, but in practice, they can be a little bit brutal. We had one with intersecting ley lines, and every time a ley line moved, you just had to recount all of the spaces and the hexes, and it would have been brilliant on a computer, but it was so frustrating on tabletop. So I think Gloomhaven, where you just kill all the enemies, smash everyone in the face, like... I don't know. I guess I'm a little bit simplistic, but that's kind of wonderful for me. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Well, as somebody who's about halfway through a Frosthaven campaign, I'm not surprised. Now, I never played the original Gloomhaven. I did play about halfway through Jaws of the Lion, which was a really nice, clean, streamlined experience. And Frosthaven, well, it's got a ton to explore in it. And that's part of the excitement about it is that every time you never know, you're going to open up some box or get some card that introduce a new mechanism that you never even knew existed before that's that's pretty exciting but it is it is pretty clunky as far as getting through the setup for a you know for a battle and the end of it and the the steps and then once you get into the the outpost phase all the steps to do with that so it just it it, it's like i've been doing day-long sessions i'm playing a two-player campaign doing day-long sessions with somebody and by the end of it i'm just like just beat down from just all the thinking that has to go into it and all the reading through the steps and everything 
Yeah, I've had sort of the same experience with Frosthaven, although I'm lucky enough to have a partner who is keeps massive spreadsheets to keep there us all go. on track and figure oh, out where we are. <laughs> Gotta have somebody <laughs> running it. That's the way to go. Yeah, that's we do. Go. Absolutely. Great pick. This is, I, I've talked about on the show, I have Frosthaven, I think it's over there now, just in the box. I haven't had the time to open up this behemoth of stuff, but a desert island would be the perfect time just to relax and get all these things out and take time and read the rules and go through and perfect place for fiddly games of all shapes and sizes, I think, in the desert island. So that's a great pick. I just got today, I got in the mail Gloomhaven Buttons and Bugs, which is this little mini solo version of Gloomhaven. And it's adorable. It comes in a Gloomhaven, like it's a, it's like a one to 24 scale box of Gloomhaven, but it's like the same size and everything. And I was looking through it and it looks like it's basically Gloomhaven with some slightly simplified rules, but streamlined enough where I feel like, wow, this will be really fun to get into, get some of the fun of those scenarios without all the weight that I'm dealing with in Frosthaven. So I'm, I'm excited to dig into that. But that's cool. That's a, that's a great pick. Well, my next pick is, this is for, you know, I told you I, I wanted to bring some games with weight on my island because I knew I was going to want a, a lot of time to explore them. But let's be honest, a lot of people don't want it, don't want that weight. They want to get in, play a game easily, and just have fun with it. And I had a few games on my list here that I thought would be fun games to go back to, kind of kind of push your luck games, kind of a little bit of randomness in them, but exciting moments. But I left off Blood Rage, and I left off Quacks of Quedlinburg, and even Battle for Rokugan, which I think has a lot of replayability in it. And I went with Clank Catacombs. Now, this isn't the same type of interactive game exactly in the same way as those, but it's just a fun game. Everybody except Adam that I've ever taught Clank to has loved it. And Chris. That's, no, that's he, 66%, but he likes that's a, like super he, majority. He loves Clank. He had, he, had one, <laughs> one bad, <laughs> he had one bad play of, of Catacombs. I can't wait to see what kind of thinks of Clank here in a second. But but the thing about Clank is that it's just it's just silly fun. It's lightweight. Everybody can get in and play it easily. And I always have a good time playing it and going back to it. And Catacombs, I think, gives it that replayability that some of the earlier versions just didn't offer quite as much because it just changes up so much the routes to go to, the things that happen. And of course, it just like some of the other games I listed earlier, it's got a big deck of cards that just change. So every game you play, you're going to see some different combos to find and things like that. So Clank Catacombs is my kind of light, midweight, fun, silly game. Interesting. Well, fortunately, we're on a desert island and begrudgingly, I'm going to come to game night at your house when it's Clank Catacombs night. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sit down and play it. I'll have a good time. So what are, what are some of the primary? So I haven't played Clank Catacombs. I did play uh, Clank Legacy, the first Clank Legacy game. Okay. Um, and I, I will admit, I sort yep. of bounced off that one a little bit. I, I found it to be a little bit frustrating, um, but I don't know the nuances. So what are kind of the couple of the primary differences with Clank Catacombs? I'll take this one, Tim. <laughs> 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 so imagine the frustration of regular Clank and then add in spinny caves that shoot you off in any direction that you <laughs> not going to know about. <laughs> and there you have Clank Category. Okay. So, Connie, what did you find frustrating about it? Um, well, I think it just felt a little bit snowball-y. It always sort of felt like the first draw just kind of controlled a lot. And sometimes you, you know, get hit with those Clank cubes at just the least opportune time. And I think that just the variance was a little high for me. But that being said, I really like some high variance games, so I don't I don't know why this one just didn't quite work. Yeah, uh, Clank Catacombs won't fix any of that, and like Adam said, maybe it even makes it a little bit worse. It is a silly push your luck game, and I never go into this game hoping to win. I just go into it hoping to have a fun time, try my best. It's always fun if I do win, but it's also fun if I get knocked out two feet from the from the safe area and just don't make any points at all. So you can't go in there with I'm going to be play competitive because just random stuff could happen to you. And this is my one pick of that type of game. I think you're absolutely right, Tim. You have to go in with that mindset. And it's a it is a really fun game. I give it a lot of a lot of heat, but yeah, it's just goofy fun. Like you are going in, you're collecting stuff, you're running around trying to get out of there before you get smoked. So it's goofy fun. I would have a lot of fun with it, even though I get a lot of heat. It's a fun game. Connie, I think the one thing about Legacy, which I, I did like Legacy a lot, but I think there's a problem with any competitive Legacy game is that it does it, it snowballs even more than just a single game because you're not just putting an hour into it. You may be putting 20 hours into it. And so you can just see this snowballing happen. And you know the people who are doing well may be getting extra benefits. And it just it gets frustrating when you get to a point in a campaign where you're like, I, I can't, there's never no way I can get out of this. I lost nine of the 10 games in that in that campaign to Chris. So I know exactly how you feel there. Now I still had a fun time with it, but um, I, I don't, you know, for me, at least this never felt, this never feels too mean because it's over in an hour and you can just, you know, try it again the next time and try a different strategy or something. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think what you said about, you know, I think 
um, competitive legacy games are just a really hard design space. And I think I've really cooled on them. I've played a few of them at this point. And I think it's hard to either not have your wins be meaningless. You know, you have such a big catch up mechanism or such a big handicap that it doesn't even matter. Why bother? Or you have the runaway leader problem. And I think it's really hard to kind of somehow kind of keep everyone competitive, but while still making the right incentives for players to do well. So I think it's, I think it's a hard space. And as I said, I think I've generally just very much cooled on that category. Yep. Yep. Makes sense. So cool to get your perspectives from a designer perspective. That's fantastic. I love it. Up next for me is hegemony lead your class to victory. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Whatever, Tim, this game is amazing. It's highly asymmetric. Every player is playing a slightly different game. And that is why I picked it. You could spend 10 games and not know one of the factions inside and out. So, and you're, we're going to have plenty of time, I'm assuming. So 10 games playing each faction, and maybe you learn them well enough to finally have a sense of what everybody else can do at the table. Now everybody knows all the other factions well, and you're getting this involved government making, designing interaction of civilization. And we're going to be able to design the best little government on our little desert island and run things efficiently for survival and prosperity and peace and happiness. All from this great game that Tim is just giving me a stone face look. He doesn't even like want to play. He's just getting angry over there. Well, actually, I'd be Chris doing that. Tim, I think, actually enjoyed this one. No, I'm just I'm just skeptical as to whether or not it's actually going to be a good government. That's that's my only comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I actually think this is probably the best case for limiting your your collection to five games of of anything that we've talked about so far, and anything on my list for sure, because this is probably a game that would just be absolutely amazing the the more you got to play it with a group of people that knew it really well so on a desert island this is like i am 100 percent in on hegemony night the only reason adam i was smirking was because it's the same top it's the same list of five games that you put on every list that we have but i'm just i'm kidding with you no hegemony is no, a great you're all right, you're right. <laughs> and i think i got some i have some surprise i have some shockers <laughs> i i actually think that this and and surprisingly even something like Root, which I've, I've not been a big fan of. And I think the problem with these games is that they're so the barrier to entry is so high on them. But if you've got just a few games to go back to again, who cares? That's exactly the point of you can have the heaviest game possible because you've got a ton of time to explore, a ton of time to learn it. And then it starts to come together and you really get to have fun with it once you already know the game. So I actually think this is an awesome pick, Adam, and kind of wish I thought of it. Well, thanks. The designers are Vangelis Bagiotakis, Varnavis Timia Tu, and it's designed by, or the publisher's Hegemonic Project Games. So yeah, thanks, Tim. I think it'd just be a great to dig deep dives and get to know this game so well. Not to mention, there's a few expansions you can throw in there if you want to. After you learned, after you spent all this time studying these four highly symmetric factions, you throw in this other stuff and you got a whole new chunk to learn. I don't even understand the the IMF coming in. So much to learn. There's this little magazine, I don't know, 30-page magazine of text that explains all the thought and all the design and has different perspectives from economists and all these academics they put all their input into this little thing. So you can learn so much about the system that, that they designed as well. And I think that's pretty cool. Connie, I don't remember if I read what you, uh, what you do for a living, but I feel like this, like, are you in like policy space? My day job is a lawyer. Um, I work for the government. I do grants law. So basically giving, giving folks, giving out money <laughs> for the federal government. Mm-hmm. Yep. No. So she does, she does this game. Exactly. She knows exactly how to play the, 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 the government, <laughs> the, the state uh, player. <laughs> 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 No, I'm just kidding. Have you have you played any like heavily asymmetric games like this? Well, so I've certainly played Root, um, and okay. you know that was definitely under consideration. I have not played Hegemony yet. I will say the theme on that one is just a little bit tough. But let me put it this way: if there's a desert island, I will happily play, and I would guess I would completely fall in love with it. <laughs> <laughs> Captive audience, right? Yeah. Um, and actually, by the way, speaking of asymmetrical games, one that narrowly missed my list is actually Station Fall as well, um, oh, okay. just because that one, I think, just has got to have replay value through the roof. And you have these sort of different rotating uh, classes of characters that really kind of would shape the game. And that one was a little bit of a painful one to leave off my list. How many times have you played St- Station Fall? <sighs> Only, I think, like three or four, maybe, which is the other reason why I left it off the list is I just didn't feel like I'd played it enough to really be able to assess that replay value. But again, it's hard to get to the table. It's big, it's complicated. The setup is pretty brutal. The teach is 
very difficult because, again, because you have a sort of a, a hidden role element of it, it's hard to ask questions. So it's one that in the real world is very hard to get to the table, but I bet you it would be a really good uh, yeah. Desert Island game. Nice. Yeah, well, we do hot takes here. So having just three or four plays of it is like extremely, like a much <laughs> higher percentage of plays than we get on most games before we give our opinions on them. <laughs> that's that's cool. I Station Fall looks really cool and I've heard some great things about it. And then I heard one review that just really turned me off on it. And I just probably need to try it. I'm, I'm definitely interested. I'm hoping to get this one played. Yeah, I think, and I don't know if you've played like Pax Mermaid or anything like that, but it's the same mm-hmm. same designer and it has sort of that same weird asymmetric feel where you're kind of allied with some of the characters, but you're also kind of not. And it's, it's, it's a very, very, very unique experience. Cool. We'll have to give that one a shot. The next one on my list, sort of in the theme of fairly heavy games, and I realized at this point in my list that I did not have a Euro, even though Euros are kind of my bread and butter and that's what I play all the time. <sighs> Uh, So I actually chose A Feast for Odin, uh, specifically with the Norwegians expansion. I had a little bit of a hard time with this one, to be honest with you. Feast for Odin is actually not my favorite Euro game. It's not my favorite worker placement game. It's not my favorite tile placement game. It's not my favorite Yui Rosenberg game. (laughs) (laughs) But it just has a little bit of everything. Um, You know, it has so many different mechanisms. It has these occupation cards that are going to send you down a slightly different strategy every single game. And I also have a lot of good friends who have played this game, you know, a hundred or 200 times sort of like Ark Nova, and they just keep playing it again and again and again. So I think the exploration value and the replay value there is so high that I figured it was just a really good game that kind of covered a lot of bases. So that one is on my list as well. Nice. Uh, so tell me, okay, I'm, I need to know what the Norwegians changes for you and, and why you think that's an important in- yeah. inclusion here. So it changes the board a little bit. It changes some of the action spaces. And then it, it changes up the animals um, a little bit and some of the sort of tetramino shapes that you're working with. And I will admit, I'm not the biggest Feast for Odin. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not the best player at it, certainly. From what I can tell and the experiences that I've had with it, I think it just opens up a lot of different strategies. Mm-hmm. On the new board, I think you have basically some very powerful action spaces that just give you a lot more flexibility each round. Cool. It sounds a lot to me like what how I felt when we added Rise of X to Dune Imperium, where basically... There was more interesting paths, and every game played out a little bit differently. Interestingly, I owned fe- I owned a feast for Odin, and I I played it a decent amount and liked it, but it was starting to get stale. And people kept telling me you got to pick up the Norwegians expansion, so I did, and then never played it again. I ended up selling it, so I never got a chance to actually try it. I, I'm I, I kind of <laughs> wish I had, and at some point, I'm sure I'll get a chance to play it with the expansion and see if I if, if I should regret giving it up. I kind of feel bad about it. I think you brought it to one of the last times we all met up, Tim. And you're like, this is, you guys want to try this with the Norwegians? It's the last time I'll have to try it. And everyone was like, eh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we kind of dismissed it. And I wish we would have pl- gave it a shot because I've heard, like Connie's saying, it adds a lot to it. Yeah, it's hard. Chris is a huge fan of this game. So I know that he is uh, at some point, I think he's got a copy too. So at some point, maybe we'll get another chance with him. But uh, interesting pick, Kenny. Thanks. Well, my second to last pick here is a game that I don't talk about a whole lot, but I think is going to give me a lot of opportunity to explore games with a different group of people than some of the other ones I mentioned. And this is Welcome to the Moon. This is by Alexis Allard and Benoit Turpin. And this is, of course, the follow on to Welcome to which is that very simple flip and write neighborhood, you know, kind of you're designing a neighborhood game. And, um, and I like welcome to it. It's very fun. Uh, you know, it can be fun with the right group. It's, it's almost a party game, except not quite a party game, but why I picked welcome to the moon was it does give me a, a great game again, kind of lightweight, like sea salt and paper, but just a little bit heavier plays a little bit longer than that. And welcome to the moon has so much to explore in there and so many different ways to play, it's got a campaign if you want to do that, but you can also just play one of these. I think it's 12, maybe it's 10 different different types of mini games in there that use the same basic rules with some minor variations to it. And I've only played five of them and all of them really felt like it was a different game to play. So I felt like this one box gives you a ton of different games to play, a ton of different games to explore. It adds some of the, the games in this box give you some you know, true player interaction in a way that welcome to never had. So it kind of adds that. So it's not just me playing, you know, my own game over here and competing for score, which I think is, you know, good when you're, when you're going to play one game over and over again, it's fun to have that human element in there, that, that little variability in there. And it's got a great solo mode, which I haven't mentioned so far, but I think having a solo mode, at least a couple of games with a solo mode is important on my desert Island. Cause sometimes I'm just going to get sick of all the people on my Island. And I need some time alone. 
Tim, what are we going to do when the dry erase markers run out of ink? <laughs> That's a great question. But again, see, this is where this is where the theme is. Is I'm struggling with because I also wouldn't have the marker to make my 52 card deck of uh, of cards uh-huh. out of sea salt and paper. Um, but yeah, so in my desert island, there's a target there. They just don't have the board <laughs> games, but I can go get dry erase markers because that is a risk. We have to come with some natural pigment of some varieties. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's right. Like uh, yeah, like like squid ink or something like that. My Number one pick is Twilight Imperium, fourth edition. This is a game I've never played. I don't know how to play it. Everyone says it's the ultimate grand board game space opera. I'm going to have plenty of time on this desert island is the big assumption I'm going in there with. So if you don't know this game, there's highly asymmetric factions. I don't know how 20 now. I don't know. There's a, a ton of highly asymmetric factions an average game is maybe in the seven to eight hour range. It can go 12 hours. So we're going to be out there as the sun's going down and the moon's coming a full moon. So we'll have plenty of light to play by. We'll have the campfire going and we'll have some twilight Imperium going on into the wee hours of the night. Maybe we'll have to save it and come back to it as the sun rises on the other side of the planet and um, warms up our crashing waves and our twilight imperium factions for the next day of play but i imagine this as again something that's going to require months and months and months of study to get really good at and to have a good sense of what's going on and then all of a sudden those nuances are going to start to emerge how to use this faction best oh i need to make this deal at this time i think that's all part of the game i don't even know these are just things i've been hearing maybe i'm giving it too much credit but this game sounds amazing. I've always wanted to try it. And I think a desert island filled with all kinds of time is the great place to do that. That's Twilight Imperium 4th Edition. Well, you are continuing to make this island sound better and better. And I will be right. right there rooting it with you. There's a few games like that that just just have missed me by and I've not had a chance to play them yet. And they're kind of on my on my bucket list of games. And that one's right at the top. I, I agree. It's a kind of another good pick in that if you've only got five games to play, this is the way to do it. Because that's the problem with Twilight Imperium is every time I think about the idea of sitting through an eight hour play, I'm like, I could have played four or five other games there. But if you've got, you know, only five games to get through, then why not? Why not dig into one deep? It sounds like it could be a lot of fun. I could also be miserable at if it makes me roll dice and lose all my ships every single time like Eclipse does, <laughs> then, you know, I might just I'd probably get, have a heart attack and die young, but at least I guess I'd have lots of games to play while I was doing it. All right. So my so the number one game on my list is Blood Bowl, which is a fantasy football game set in the Warhammer universe. And when I say fantasy football, I mean it's orcs versus elves versus halflings versus you know necromantic versus ratmen, etc. It's one of my favorite games of all time. I may never play it again. But you are going to pry my Blood Bowl minis out of my cold dead hands. You are never going to take them away from me. Wow. It's a long game. It's two and a half to three hours. It's a head versus head game. Um, it's incredibly punishing. It's very, very high luck. It's basically uh, based on a D6 system where if you roll a one, no matter how easy it is, whatever it is you're trying to do, you almost always lose. Your turn ends. There's a lot of misery. You have these star players that get skills over the course of 10 or 20 or 30 games and Oftentimes it is in your opponent's best interest to stomp on them until they die. Um, So it's a game that has both permanent skill progression and permanent loss. All of that said, it is probably the highest skill ceiling game I think I've ever played. I think it's really up there with, you know, Magic the Gathering or something like that. It creates amazing memories and stories. I mean, it's just a completely bonkers game. I mean, you throw a ball into the crowd and it bounces all over the field and then you shove somebody into the crowd and the crowd beats them up, except maybe sometimes they don't. Sometimes you'll have a tree man pick up a halfling who's holding the ball and throw him down the field. And, and it's just, you get these absolutely insane memories. There's an incredible amount of variability. Each team plays entirely differently. And the best possible format for Blood Bowl is playing a season of 20 or 30 or 40 games, <laughs> doing a playoffs and then starting all over again with wow. a new team. I mean, it's I've joined Blood Bowl leagues in the past and it's so hard to get it to work because it's such a high time commitment, but you really want all of these skills that are building on your players over game after game after game. So I just think it's the perfect, it was the first game that came to mind when this topic popped up. I just have such a complicated relationship with this game. I don't know if you guys have played it at all, but my number one is Blood Bowl. Did you paint your minis? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's that's why you want to hang out to them. No, this is cool. I've actually been really interested in trying this game for years. I'm not a football person. I, I'm not a Warhammer person. 
you know, there's almost nothing about this that would recommend it to me other than it just sounds fun. And some of the things you explained to me reminded me a lot of playing like Thunder Road Vendetta, where just kind of random stuff happens. And now it sounds like there's a lot more time commitment to this. And maybe that could be really frustrating. But I, for me, I think if I go into a game with the, knowing that it's kind of telling a story, you're doing your best, you're just having fun moments in it, then I'm excited. And so you just made it sound more exciting even than I'd heard before. So I'm, I'm in. I don't know if I'm in for 20 or 30 games, but I'm in for at least... <laughs> For at least a couple. Connie, I think this is an amazing pick. I am in for 20 or 30 games. I love the idea of that progression and holding on, building up your team, building up your players. That sounds amazing to me. And this is a game I would never, I would never ever want to approach it until hearing someone like you talk about it with such like passion and describe it. That is so fun when you have someone that's so into something and they can like share that with you. Oh, it just makes a game so much more fun. So and just watching you describe this game made me want to try a game that I really had little interest in, but now like hearing how that progresses and doing this whole playoff thing, we're going to have a desert Island, like little football league going on. It sounds fantastic. What a great pick and a game that was totally off my radar. Yeah. yeah. Well, and as I said, it's, it's a tricky one because it's very high skill and it's very high luck, which can just make it, Again, especially if you have limited time to play games, it can make it pretty brutal. But man, with unlimited time, I mean, again, the stories and the progression are just top notch. Very cool. Adam wants to play with somebody that has that much passion. I want to play with somebody that has painted minis. So I mean, yeah, that too. <laughs> I think you're you're the perfect person to play with for both of us. All right. Well, the last game on my list is not going to be a big surprise because this is right in my wheelhouse, but this is Age of Innovation. Gaia Project last year was my number two game on my list, my number two favorite game of all time. And then since then, we did a feature review of Age of Innovation. I've had a chance to play it a couple of times since then. And I think it's even better than Gaia Project. I just absolutely love... This is one of those rare games that doesn't have a lot of variability, at least not variability that happens during the game. You know exactly what the board state is, what all the scoring opportunities are from the start of the game. And every decision you make, nothing's going to surprise you with it. This is like my chess. This is the this is what I want chess to be. I don't want an abstract game that you're just head to head on. I want a game that has tons of levers to pull, tons of things that can happen, tons of bonuses, tons of things you're racing people for, whether it's territories on the board or or you know bonus opportunities or you know things like that. And Age of Innovation has a ton of variability in the setup, which is where it really needs it if you're going to play a game indefinitely. Every game is going to play out a little bit different depending on the factions you get and and the different um, you know the different uh, technology tiles that are available that game. So I think I'm going to be exploring Age of Innovation for years to come, even if it was one of my only you know only five games I had. I don't think I I don't see myself ever getting tired of it. Probably sixty or seventy games in a Gaia project at this point, and I still love it every single time. And Age of Innovation. You know, if I could, if I could get it played that much, I think I'm still going to be loving it. Well, clarify for me. Do you, which one do you prefer at the moment? Guide Project or Age of Innovation or? Age of Innovation is my favorite of the two. You do? Okay. Yeah. And what puts Age of Innovation over the top of Guide Project? Because I was close to putting Guide Project on my list, but what puts Age of Innovation over Guide Project for you? It's hard to explain because I think in reality, some of these mechanisms work exactly the same, but the way that the movement kind of the, the way you build out and move on the board in, in Age of Innovation just feels less painful to me. I don't know if it's because the economy is a little looser because the power movement is a little bit easier to work with. It doesn't feel as hard to move around and kind of build things up. So it feels like you get to do more in a game of age of innovation. I also like the fact that the the way that they added variability instead of a, a like kind of a variable board, a modular board like Gaia Project has, is that you mix and match the color, you know, kind of the, the terrain type that you work with, with the faction. So you don't have to have the same faction as always red or is always orange or whatever they, you mix them up. So you get an interesting mix of where you're, you know, where your best focus is on the map and what you're competing for as far as spaces, even if you're playing a different territory. Um, and then there's, there's more variability in like the, the kind of the text that you can build. And it's just, a, it's just enough different in the system that so far, and it's only been a few plays for me, but so far, I think, it just feels like it's going to just give me more to explore, even though Gaia Project has plenty. So if, if Age of Innovation didn't exist, Gaia Project would probably be on the spot. But I think I like Age of Innovation a little bit. So Connie, two part question for you. Do you have any opinion on the Gaia Project Age of Innovation? And then second part, as a designer, how do you feel about iterations and board game design? <laughs> and are, you ever really, are you ever really done like designing a board game? So I don't think you're ever really done designing a board game, um, as I think the Terra Mystica to Gaia Project Age of Innovation um, shows. I don't have strong feelings um, on that particular series, but I do think that 
you know, I think there's been a certain amount of like saturation and frustration in the market with some of these sort of sequels, but I also think there's been some really good things that have come out of them too. I mean, you know, Age of Innovation, some of the Great Western Trail games, some of the Azul games, I really enjoy some of the sequels. I see you're grimacing a little bit, <laughs> Adam, but, um, uh, you know, I, I really like some of the Azul sequels. And so I, I think it's tough. I mean, you know, with, with game design as with anything, you're kind of building on the shoulders of the people who came before. And so it's always kind of that fine line of like, you always want to be adding something new while recognizing that it's, it's again, you're never done. I mean, if I could go back to Apiary, there's things that I would change. If I could go back to Wormspan, there's things that I could change. I would guess every designer feels like that. Yeah, that's what I figured. That's cool to see. And it's interesting to see how these iterations come out. And I know Reiner Knizia, he'll put out the card game variation of something and the dice version of something. And like, I don't know, he's got so many, I don't know how many games, a thousand games or something. And half of them seem like they're all re-implementations of something else. So interesting. Yeah. I mean, my own thoughts on that are like whiplash over this last year, because we got Age of Innovation, which I did not expect to even want to play because I was like, Gaia Project's a perfect game. We, we don't need another variation. And then we got Dune Imperium Uprising, which I was like, oh, this is just trying to sell new new players the same game, but it's it's actually better. I couldn't believe it. And then we got Wormspan, Connie, which is, <laughs> I mean, for me, the theme is just was more exciting to start with, but the game ended up being just a better fit for me, which was awesome, even though it uses a lot of the same mechanisms as, as yeah. Wingspan. So I, I definitely have shifted on that this year just because so many of those evolutions have been just better than the games that were already great games that came before them. And, yeah. and that's really cool to see. I would put a, in a vote for Everdale Farshore as well. I was very skeptical of that one when it came out. Um, and we actually got rid of Everdale and now we just have Farshore because it turns out that oh, wow. when we wanted to play that game, we didn't want to play it with all the expansions. We didn't want yeah. it to become really complicated. We just want it to be simple and streamlined and our shore is better at doing that. So. That's so funny. And I'm so worried to, to try that because I'm afraid I'm going to feel the same thing. And I have the complete collection with all the expansions. And the hard part is I was a play tester on some of the expansions. So my name's in the rule book. So how can I get rid of those games that actually have oh, my no, name in the rule book? <laughs> you got to keep them. So, so then what's the point of me even playing Far Shore? Because I'm not going to want to know that that game exists that I don't want in my collection. So, But that's a that's a great call out, Connie. I've kind of heard the same thing. And I suspected just by looking at it that it's probably the perfect streamlined version of, of Everdell. And so um, that's cool. Now I guess I'm going to have to try it. Dang it. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, that wraps up our list. Now, did you guys have any final thoughts, any runners up that you feel like you really just missed the boat getting on this island? I do have a couple. So along the lines of a deck of cards and a great game, Capital Lux 2. So <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully Chris doesn't wash up because <laughs> he will not be happy with me with that pick. But I think that's a fantastic card. It's so cool. It's cool. I don't care what you say, Tim. Don't look at me. I'm just going to look down <laughs> my paper. Zia, Legends of a Drift System. The expansion, the uh, that adds this a more dynamic little market to it. That's a sort of a sandbox game, of course, in outer space, which I love. So you can go fly around, do whatever you want. You want to play to twenty points? That's you want to play to thirty points, fifty points. How many points you want to play to? It does you pick a number and you go until you get sick of the game, and then you're done. But multiple different strategies. Do whatever you want. Upgrade your ship. Go be a space pirate. Go be a merchant. Go be a trader. Do whatever you want to do. That's Zia Legends of a Drift system. I think that'd be a blast. I thought was it. Those are my runner ups. Oh, yeah, yeah, I had a few. Um, so it really kind of hurt me to not put a real party game, like a real yeah. whatever party game on my list. And that was just kind of a category that got cut. But I really wanted to crypto as one of my favorite games of all time. And I think I could play that game until the end of time. And so that one was a hard cut. I really enjoy like where words um, or code names, um, you know, so not having one of those felt really painful. And then there's a few euros too. I mean, we talked about Dune Imperium. We talked about Lost Ruins of Arnak briefly. Um, Voyages of Marco Polo is one of my favorite games of all time. I mean, I've probably Wonderful. played that game a hundred times. Um, you know, yeah. Grand Austria Hotel was another one that I was mm. like, no, I really want this game. <laughs> you know, I didn't have a Stefan Feld on my list and I love an awful lot of his games as well. So those are a few, a few of the ones that, that just missed the cut. Yeah. Party game list, a, a party game category was so hard for me to cut because I know that that's the right fit. You like you should have a party game in your house because there's going to be situations where it's just the right thing to bust out in a social environment and things like that. And I, w I wanted to put code names so bad, but then I'm like, oh, you can only play a team. So then it eliminates the, you know, three player or five player. Well, you can play five player, I guess, but, but then we can make, we can make skull with the components on the island. Oh, <laughs> oh that's right. Like that. some circles. Yeah, square, <laughs> yeah totally. Don't even need to, yeah, don't need to bring a game there. But uh, yeah, totally kind of, I, in fact, I've never played uh, to crypto. I've heard great things about it. So I got to get that one played for sure. But I was thinking like um, just one or uh, a fun facts is a recent one in that series that I really, that I've really enjoyed. But yeah, you got to have a, you got to have a party game and 
and then I was thinking about like, well, what do I really want to play for the rest of my life? And afraid party games just don't make the list that often. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had sort of the same experience. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, tons of euros got cut for me, but again, I think I picked a couple that would that would keep me satisfied indefinitely. I really, honestly, feel like I could be pretty happy playing these five games repeatedly and going back to them. But I do like the exploration as well. So, luckily, this was just a thought exercise, and we don't actually have to get rid of the rest of our collections and bring five games. All right. Well, this will pretty much wrap up the show. Now, Connie, are you into social media? Do you like being on social media? Do you like interacting with your <laughs> with your fans on social media? I will admit I'm terrible at being on social media, but I am um, at Connie V D C on both Twitter and Blue Sky and do post on occasion. Okay. And then the last question I have to ask you, because our fans would be relentless if we didn't, and that is, can you tell us anything about what's coming next? Uh, no, unfortunately, I can't say anything about what's coming next, but I will say that I'm going to keep designing games. I absolutely love it. So I think, unfortunately, folks are stuck with me for a little while. That's great news. Well, you had a great start. I Didn't I see, though, isn't there at least an apiary expansion announced already? Yep. Yep, there is. There has been an APR expansion announced. That's awesome. That's correct. I'm so excited about that. That's very cool. All right. Well, cool. Before we wrap up, as always, we do like to give our listeners a shout out if they said something nice to us. Connie, I'm, I apologize. You got to sit through this. But uh, we had a, a listener from the UK, from Great Britain, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. The title was Superior Board Game Podcast. They said, this is without doubt the best board game podcast out there, and there are many. These guys are great, and here's why. One, no corporate stooge. They tell you how it is. If it's bad, they say. If it's great, they say. They also highlight all elements and give an informed opinion. Two, they have great chemistry, and it's like listening to myself and my friends after playing board games. The genuine joy can be heard, as well as the frustration at points, and it just makes it real. That's, I think, Adam frustrated with me most of the time is what he's talking about there. All directions, I feel like. (laughs) Three, can't speak for everyone, but my tastes are very much in line with them. And I've even specifically gone out searching for board games based on the recommendations. And four, it's just a great mix of how to play games, reviews on games, and what I want from a conversation about board games. A must listen. So this was Bristol Edit from Great Britain. And based on all of our Great Britain comments lately, I must say Britain really is great. So we really appreciate the reviews from from our friends across the uh, across the sea over there. Right. I know I know where to go when I retire. I have a couple supporters over there. Not the desert island. Oh well, that's a tough job. <laughs> <Not. laughs> it is an island. It, it is, is an island. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. Well, thanks again, Connie. And if anyone's interested in uh, you know hearing more about Connie's games, now that you've had a chance to get to know her a little bit, we did do a feature review of Apiary. That was episode 177. And we did a feature review of Wormspan episode 180. So if you're interested in digging in a little bit more on her designs, check it out. Connie, thank you f- so much for joining us. It was super fun. Huge fan of your game so far. And that's, that's no BS. Really, really enjoy. And I can't wait to see what you do next. Connie, thank you so much for coming on the show. Love to hear your passion for board games. I would love to talk to you for another couple hours and just pick your brain and hang out and have a conversation. You seem like a cool person. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. All right. Until next week. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.